Our scripture lesson today, as Lisa had said, comes from the New Testament book of the Acts of the Apostles, the fourth chapter. Hear now these words. Indeed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with Gentiles and Israelites did gather in the city against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and plan had already determined would happen. Now, Lord, take note of their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with boldness. Stretch out your hand to bring healing and enable signs and wonders to be performed through the name of Jesus, your holy servant. And after they prayed, the place where they were gathered was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking God's word with boldness. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, my dear friends, let me ask you a question. Why do you come to church? Why do you come? Why are you here today? And for those of you who are watching online, you might type in the chat, why do you watch church online? Why do you worship? Is it for comfort? Is it for inspiration? Is it for spiritual food to make you feel good? Or is it something else? That's a question that a group of retired pastors were talking about not long ago. Now, you know, we have quite a few retired clergy who are connected here with Washington Street United Methodist Church. And it's good for us from time to time to get together and talk with one another. But it seems that every time I'm engaged in conversation with a retired clergy person or an active clergy person these days, our conversation sometimes gets around one way or another to what kind of church we want to be, to the state of the church in this day and age to what is going on as United Methodists consider the looming divide that is before us. Well, as we get into those conversations, every now and again, someone will lift up a question by saying, you know, this is a good opportunity for us to rethink the meaning of church, for us to think about what needs to change for us to think about what needs to be done better, for us to think about what we need to clean up. And the larger question of why are people coming to church anyway? And why are people not coming to church? Who is it that we're supposed to be as a church? So I've titled this sermon series that I'm starting today, The Church That the World Needs. What kind of church does the world need today? What kind of church do you want to be a part of and connected to? Several of us have gotten together over the last several months, and we've said that one of the key things that the church needs today is the opportunity to build relationships with other people to reconnect after the pandemic that has separated us, to reconnect after so much divides us in this world. We need a place where everyone knows your name, like the old Cheers song, right? We need a place to belong and to have relationships with one another, a place where we can be comforted and share life with one another. But a wise clergy friend said recently, but we also need a church that challenges us. A church that challenges us to be better people. A church that challenges us to be workers in the kingdom, to make this world a better place. After all, that's what Jesus did, isn't it? Jesus challenged everyone to be better, to strive to do more and to be better people, to make a difference in this world a positive difference in this world. And yet, it seems that the boldness and the energy to do that is waning in so many churches today. We get caught up in conversations of conflict 
rather than increased boldness to actually be workers in the kingdom, to step up and to step out and to make a difference in this world. So I started thinking, what kind of church does God dream for us to be? What kind of church would be the perfect church in the community in this day and age? Now I know there's really no such thing as a perfect church, but I read a story not long ago about a church by the name of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Beulah, Michigan. It was built on the site of what dreams are made of, they say. Sits perched on a high ridge overlooking rolling hills and an orchard and a beautiful lake. And they say that you can see Lake Michigan and the Empire Dunes in the distance. On a clear day, you can see all the way to the islands. The church has beautiful open beams in the ceiling. And on three sides, it's just solid glass so that you can see out. No matter where you're seated in the sanctuary, you can see that beautiful setting where the church is placed. Beautiful from floor to ceiling. It's worth going to that church, they say, just for the quality of the architecture and the beauty. Well, Ned Edwards was the pastor when that church was built. And during the summer when the church opened, Ned relays this story. He says, This summer I have spent at least one or two hours every day guiding people who stop to see this wonderful, beautiful church building. And one man said to me, with all the glass and the high ceiling and the beautiful view, is this the church you've always dreamed of? Ned said, I started to say yes, but I knew that wasn't true. I said, well, this is the church I've always dreamed of, but not because of the windows or the view." Not because of the high ceiling, not because of the amazing organ and the pews, the artwork that is here. It's the church of my dreams because of the amazing group of people who come alive together in Christ, who have found a spirit of joy in this community of faith and who have expressed it in the building. He's right, of course. The church of our dreams is not just about a beautiful, renovated building. As beautiful and majestic as Washington Street Church is, and as wonderful a job as our trustees do on keeping it beautiful and updated, and of all the wonderful work that they've done to make it a place that shouts the glory of God. The real beauty of this church is you. The people, all the people of the church. When you are alive in Christ and filled with the joy of God's Spirit, this church is a church that everyone dreams of. Church of our dreams. Our scripture lesson today tells me that in the book of Acts, when the church very first began, it was a church of dreams to begin with. You remember in chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Acts, we read about the, whole, about the church being birthed when the Holy Spirit first came upon those disciples. And Peter was emboldened to go out and to preach to the people. And 3,000 people joined the church right away. And Peter and the other disciples are filled with joy that people are receiving this message of Jesus Christ risen and the joy in life that Jesus came to bring. And so they go about Jerusalem preaching about Jesus. And in chapters 3 and 4, we read 
that Peter and John are preaching about Jesus and they're walking into the temple one day and they see a man who's laying at the steps and the man is lame. Now, lame doesn't mean in the Bible what it means today. It doesn't mean he was lazy. It means that he couldn't walk, right? And he couldn't walk since birth. And he's laying there and he's just begging everyone for money as they come into the temple. And Peter says to the man, I don't have any money to give you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And the scripture says that the man jumped up and he was able to walk for the first time in his life. And not just walk, but he's leaping with joy and praising God as he goes into the temple. And so what does Peter do in response? He does what every good preacher does. He starts preaching again. And he preaches about the resurrection of Jesus and how it's the power of Jesus that allowed this man to walk again. And when he does, the authorities get upset. And the scripture tells us that it's the chief of the temple and the Sadducees and the priest who were upset. And they arrest Peter and John. And they don't really know what to do with them, what to charge them with. They want to charge them with being false prophets or something, but they can't really do that because everybody's seen that this man who was lame is now walking. So obviously they do have power. So they decide just to let them off with a warning. And they say to Peter and John, you know, we don't want you talking anymore about Jesus being the Messiah. We don't want you talking anymore about Jesus being resurrected. In fact, we don't want you talking about Jesus anymore at all. You've got so many people who are following you now. The followers of Jesus have a 100% approval rating right here, and that's kind of threatening to us. So just tamp it down. And don't talk about it anymore. Maybe this little Jesus movement will disappear. So Peter and John leave. And they go back to all the other disciples. Now what do you think you would do when you have just left a place from being arrested by people who had Jesus crucified? What do you think you would do? I might hightail it out of town and say I'm going to another community. But that's not what they did. They gathered together and they prayed. They prayed. And what did they pray for? What would you pray for? If you had just been arrested by people who had Jesus crucified and then they let you go... Wouldn't you be afraid they might be watching you and arrest you again? And maybe your life was under danger just as Jesus had been? What would you pray for? I know what I would pray for. I'd pray for protection, right? Protect me from these people who have arrested me falsely and who were the ones who instigated the trial against Jesus. Protect me from these people. But that's not what these disciples prayed for. The scripture says very clearly here that they prayed, as Lisa said, for boldness to preach God's word. Now they've just been told not to preach God's word anymore. Don't mention Jesus anymore. But they prayed that they might be bold to keep on preaching about Jesus. To not be scared to do it just because of the threats that were lodged against them from outside. They prayed for boldness to preach God's word. Even though preaching God's word is what got them in trouble to begin with. They wanted to be more bold to go out and proclaim God's word to the world. Now, my dear friends, I want to ask you, 
Have you ever prayed to be bold? Have you ever prayed to be bold in your faith? And if so, when was the last time you prayed to be bold? To stand up, to stand tough, and to stand tall, no matter the consequences. To stand up for truth, to stand up for what is right, to speak up and to speak out. You know, Washington Street United Methodist Church has a long history of being a community of faith that has not been afraid to stand up, to stand tall, and to stand for truth. And yet the more conflicted our world becomes and the more divided our world becomes, the harder it seems to summon the courage to continue being bold, to be bold in the face of difficulty and disunity and disbelief. But my friends, that's how the church grew. Have you ever thought about it? How did the church move out of first century Palestine and just a handful of small disciples who were uneducated with no church structure, no church council, no funding, and yet they grew, and the word of God spread, and churches popped up everywhere, all throughout the centuries, so that over 2,000 years later, here we are. It grew simply because of the boldness of those early disciples receiving the Holy Spirit at work in their lives to empower them and equip them to do what they could not do on their own so that when people looked at them, the scripture says, when people saw these disciples, they marveled and were amazed at their boldness. My friends, that's the kind of church that I dream of. A church where people look at us and they say, you know, they couldn't do what they do without the power of the Holy Spirit at work in them, emboldening them to move forward in life. They couldn't forgive one another the way they do if it were not for the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. They could not love their enemies and pray for those who persecute them if it were not for the power of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. They could not do the acts of service they do day in and day out despite the criticisms of others if it were not for the Holy Spirit at li alive and at work in their lives. They could not be so generous as to give to so many ministries in this community if it were not for the power of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. When people look at this church, I want them to see us doing such miraculous, wonderful things that they marvel and they wonder, what is God doing among those people in that church that they have the boldness to do so many good and joyful things in this world? I think I want to go inside that building and find out what God is doing there. That's how the church grew, my friends from people, one at a time, being filled with the Holy Spirit and being bold enough to act on what God had called them to do. I'm talking about a deep boldness, a deep boldness like little David had in the Old Testament, a boldness that allowed him to go up and fight against Goliath because he knew that God was with him, a boldness like Caleb and Joshua in the Old Testament. You remember Caleb and Joshua? Moses led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. He was leading them to the promised land that God had given to them, a land called a land of milk and honey. And before they got there, Moses appointed 12 men to go into that promised land as spies. Joshua and Caleb were two of those men. They went into the land, and when they got there, they saw that they had these big military-type guys, seven and eight feet tall. 
men, ten of the men, ten of the spies, hunkered down and thought, ooh, those big guys are never going to let us just move into that land without a fight, and there's no way that we can fight men that big and that strong. We're going to go back with this intel, and we're going to tell Moses there's no way we can go into that land. God got it wrong. This is not the promised land for us. We can't do it. But Caleb said, yes, we can. God said, go into this land. If God is with us, we can do it. Caleb was bold. Caleb was in his 40s at that time, but he was bold. And he said, let's go. But of course they didn't. They listened to the majority report. And they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. And then by the time Caleb and Joshua are around 80, 85 years old, the opportunity comes up for them to go into the promised land again. And you know what Caleb said? Caleb said, let's go. I'm leading the pack. Charge. Let's go. I don't care how old they think I am. I know that God is with me, and I can do this because God is with me. That's the kind of boldness I'm talking about. Boldness to face the odds no matter what they are. Boldness to dream God's dreams and to do the things that God is calling us to do. Boldness to reach out with the gifts of love and forgiveness, grace and mercy in the world around us using the gifts that God has given to us. Now let me bring it home a little bit and tell you how this might play out in your own life. I read a story in Guidepost a few years back. It's a story about Troy Vincent, a successful NFL player and executive who overcame domestic abuse as a child. And he credits his faith with a particular Sunday where he felt God say to him, if you will give me your life, then I will use your past to help others. And that's what he did. Throughout his career, he devoted himself to volunteering at battered women's shelters and standing up against abuse. But in the article, what he shared about was a teammate. A teammate in the locker room one day joking about women and holding up a magazine picturing women for everyone in the locker room to laugh at. And he waited until this teammate was finished. And then he called him aside. He said, hey, come over here. I've heard you say you want to find a nice lady one day and marry her. And you'd like to raise a daughter, have a good family. Would you want your daughter one day to hear you talking like you just did about the women in that magazine? You're a leader on this team, but what you're doing right now is not leading. He said the guy was angry with him at first for being so bold and stepping out and talking to him like that. But the guy never repeated that behavior again in that locker room. Years later, the two of them were together at a benefit, and the other player shared that story. He shared the story about what Vincent had said to him. And he told the audience, that comment changed my life. Friends, that's the kind of church we need to be. In big ways and in small ways. When you hear people telling racist jokes, when you see people doing things that bring harm to others, when you see people who are suffering in this world, we need to be a church that stands up and speaks out. It's easier to do it on big scales and to march in a march. It's harder to go to a coworker, a neighbor, or a family member and say, hey, that joke you just told, it's not really funny. It's hurtful, it's painful. It's not the way we're called to treat one another as children of God. The conflict in our world, my friends, makes us want to come to church to hide, 
to seek comfort for ourselves, to be shored up. But my friends, the Jesus we follow calls us to go outside of these walls with boldness to share God's news of grace and love. So I want to close by reminding us all of the work of Ilya Prijonjin. Prijonjin, hard for me to say his name. Russian names are hard. But in 1977, he was the winner of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And he pointed out that when certain chemicals combine, there's a reaction that makes things appear like they're falling apart. But in reality, they're just or reorganizing themselves at a higher level. And this is called perturbation, from which we get the word perturbed. Have you ever been perturbed at anyone? He said, a parent doesn't get perturbed, a parent who doesn't get perturbed by the reactions they have from their children because it feels like things are falling apart is rare to find. All of us get perturbed at times, feeling like things are falling apart in the world around us. But in reality, it may just be part of the process of chemicals reorganizing themselves at a higher level. So when things perturb us in the world, why don't we let the power of the Holy Spirit reorganize things at a higher level and with boldness make this world better? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may we be bold and courageous. Amen.